Hey, Guy Powell here, and welcome to the next episode of the Backstory on Marketing and AI. If you haven't already done so, please visit ProRelevant.com and sign up for more of these episodes and podcasts. So I am the author of the newly released book, The Post-COVID Marketing Machine, Prepare Your Team to Win. And you can find out more information on this at marketingmachine.prorelevant.com. So AI is here, AI is everywhere, and uh, CMOs certainly have uh, are trying to get uh, an advantage out of AI, but they haven't quite gotten there yet, at least in most cases. And also there's definitely a, a fear of missing out. So there's FOMO and they're worried about when they get together with other CMOs, they wonder where they are and they're, they're finding out that they're not really that far behind. Well, today I'm interviewing Mark Himmelsbach and he is uh, with uh, episode four and he's got some really interesting stuff going on in AI and uh, in the marketing space, and hopefully how we as marketers can take advantage of this this wave that's uh, really uh, that we're all trying to ride here. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about Mark. He is the co-founder of the world's newest creative AI marketing tool called RYA. He's also the co-founder of Episode Four, which is an advertising agency that leverages data to make hits for Visa, Invesco, QQQ, Charles Schwab, AT&T, and many other marquee brands. Over the last two decades, he has led cross-functional teams and developed multidiscipline communications and creative strategies for both for-profit and non-profit organizations. And uh, I'm sad to say he has an MBA from Northwestern Kellogg School of Management, I got my MBA from University of Chicago, so we're we're going against each other here. That's so all right. I, I reluctantly decided to uh, <laughs> interview him today. Mark, welcome. So good to have you. Oh, thanks for having me, Guy. I'm excited to be here, despite the Chicago connection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, anyway, uh, Mark, thank you so much. So uh, tell us about your backstory on AI and marketing. How did you get into this uh, into this really cool stuff? Um, sure. Th uh, thanks for having me again. I, when I joined the advertising industry, I had a career before that, but after Kellogg, I joined um, Omnicom and was introduced to all sorts of technology. I became the head of digital strategy, and that was the era of Tumblr, Twitter, the iPhone, Facebook. I was one of the first people to have a Facebook account at an ad agency, um, just because of the way the timing shook out. So I was responsible for understanding that type of technology and translating it to our to our clients, to brands. Um, and working at great agencies like BBDO and Ogilvy and IPG over time, um, that job evolved, technology evolved, and it was still about explaining technology and how to use it for brands to make better interactions, engagements with consumers. Um, so when we saw AI came come out, uh, my co-founder Teddy and I realized that we were in we were seeing an avalanche about to happen, something that will change marketing. And instead of being at the bottom of the hill, what happens if we could be at the top of the hill? So what happens instead of having, you know, having AI um, change our agency, what if we were part of that change? And so we really decided to take AI head on, um, use the data that we have in Raya, um, and really think about how we can transform our business, our legacy business into a new modern business. Yeah, fantastic. So tell us about uh, episode four. And I didn't realize you uh, pronounced it as Raya. So and then definitely tell us about Raya. Um, yeah, so episode four, um, we started seven years ago, and we make hits for brands. And the idea of um, we are now, you know, a couple dozen people at episode four, but the idea when we started of two guys walking into a room with a brand and saying, this idea is cool, trust us, didn't get us very far. And we knew that wouldn't get us very far. Though that ad industry is built on they trust us and it's a great industry and a great, great uh, purpose. We realized that we needed data to give brands permission to buy and make better, cooler, bolder things. So we set out to survey Americans. So seven years ago, um, we started surveying Americans and asked them what they would do with their free time or extra money. A very simple question, um, because if you ask almost any human at any time, what would you do if I gave you one wish? that wish will probably boil down to more time or more money or both, except you can't ask for more wishes, but that's a separate topic. Um, but when we, we asked people, what would you do with your free time or extra money? Um, we presented them with 180 different genres 
These are things you can listen to, eat, read, watch, attend. We asked them um, what they would do across 20 different actions. So hang out with friends, go on a trip, et cetera. And then 30 different demographic questions, the ones you would expect and the ones you wouldn't. We get to B2B decision makers. We you know, understand what zip code they're in, which is more predictable. Um, but what we learned is that over time, we have a data set of almost 6 billion data points about the American consumer. And so we could go into any client, ask who their audience is, and tell them exactly what they're into or not. So when we first walked into Charles Schwab, and we helped Schwab across a, a number of different things, um, one of which is their sponsorship work in golf, um, we asked that we at, used Raya and determined that golf fans, especially the ones that Schwab cares about, um, the thing they're most into is muscle cars and reality shows. And that that kind of seems obvious, but we had the data to prove it. So when we went to Schwab, even Chuck Schwab himself, and said, let's build a muscle car to give away at your golf tournament, the Charles Schwab Challenge, Chuck was like, no way we're going to do that. Why would we ever build a, build a half a million dollar muscle car? And we showed him the data, and Schwab said, oh, okay, if that's true, then that gave, gives me the permission. They didn't say this, but it gives me the permission to, to do that. And so episode four, along with Raya, um, always use data to convince clients to do something cool uh, because their audience would be most into it. Um, and then a, about a year ago, maybe a little bit more, again, this AI revolution, which you so eloquently talk about, it, we decided to not only have our data about audiences, but start training AI, um, truly training AI on how to be more creative. And that's where we're going now. And it's been really fascinating, fun, somewhat scary to see AI, see if it can be creative or, or it needs some help. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I like your uh, uh, your example there of uh, building muscle cars. Uh, I'm not a golf fan, but nevertheless, I wouldn't mind getting a muscle car. <laughs> exactly. You know, um, it was a it was a Corvette this year from the 70s. So it worked out. <laughs> very nice very nice so uh so uh so how do you think ai is going to otherwise impact the marketing industry i've seen a handful of different inroads and tests and trials but what do you think is really going to be uh you know the next big thing for the marketing industry well right now it seems like a lot of marketing um how ai is used in marketing is kind of what i call back of the house so it's to make systems run more efficiently to help, I don't know, SEO or ad targeting it's to help generate headlines or blog posts or imagery. And then that's always tweaked. It is not very front of the house. It's not very publicly facing where, where AI is helping. So it's now being used to make efficient and effective back office or kind of in the weeds where the sausage is made to use, pick a cliche. Um, but right now, no one is on the forefront of using AI with customers or clients or consumers in mind. So I think the next big shift will be taking it mm -hmm. kind of behind the scenes and in front of people. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, I interviewed uh, somebody uh, last week and and they are using AI to uh, basically generate a whole world within which you can then, you know, ha uh, you know develop your commercials and just fascinating. And it's so I, I think you're right. I think that the front side, the back side is being integrated and it's being used pretty well. You know, there's a couple of things, but I think you're right. The uh, the front side or the public facing side is definitely the next big, huge uh, opportunity for marketers. Totally. And I think a, a classmate of mine is the head of innovation at Yum! Brands, and they are rolling out AI into all of their drive throughs now. Hmm. And <clears throat> if that works, will customers know about it, feel it, or will they, will it feel, <clears throat> excuse me, feel special to them? Um, that's the big question. And if, if it doesn't, that's okay, as long as it works. So I think when customers start to feel AI, um, mm -hmm. that will be a big shift in the public perception. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And and I think you're right. I think though the public is also starting to get used to AI in little ways. You've got chat engines and chat bots and, and they're realizing that you know, the, the, some of them are pretty good. Some of them are limited yet, but the ones totally. that are pretty good, I'm, I, I am really surprised at it, at how well they do. Me too. And it's, um, it's always refreshing to see 
um, when you don't have to go through, you know, talk to a human, talk to a human, um, agent, <laughs> agent. And when something the chatbot can solve your problems, that makes my, my life a lot easier. Yeah, it definitely goes a lot faster. And I, I don't know, I guess maybe, you know, I, I do have to, you know, choose between, you know, one or the other. And sometimes you realize there's no way this chatbot is going to figure it out. Oh, just please <laughs> get me a person. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, so, um, you know, with AI though, it does uh, and let's say AI now moving more into the front of the house. Um, uh, do you what do you see that as uh, doing towards affecting jobs, the the marketing jobs and other jobs related to that? I think I it's cliche now, but um, there's a lot of tweets and a lot of posts that say AI is not going to take your job, but a human using AI will. And I think that still is the case and will be the case for a long, long time. So I think the, in terms of jobs, I think some of the rote, um, some of the entry level jobs um, might be, need to be restructured, rethought about, or might be in trouble. And I think, but when I look at that, I see like kind of the retraining and reskilling of those lower, the entry level jobs, um, making them much more productive and much more necessary to the machinery of marketing. I think that the people who are in most trouble are the ones who are hiding their head in the sand. I think there will be plenty of, I think, as um, we've talked about, I think having AI is like having a great college intern next to you. And if you can leverage that to be more productive, more eff effective and efficient, I think you as a human marketer will still be around for a long, long time. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, though, there's a challenge um, as uh, AI gets you know more integrated into marketing, where the kind of the, you know, where the help or the value comes in is if I have somebody that's very knowledgeable about the customers and the category and, you know, and what's going on there using AI to, uh, to support that person. And, um, and the challenge is though, how do you grow uh, entry level marketers so that they can be on the, the other side, on the knowledgeable side quickly enough so that you can, yeah, you know, make them very, very productive, uh, very quickly as it relates to understanding your customer and your category and your market. Yeah, and I think there's a there is a supply and demand kind of parallel there. I think if um, if the marketing leadership doesn't train their people better, then I think they will be floundering and they will just adapt tools that are eighty percent good. And so I think there is a lot of training that is necessary to get entry level or kind of people in early in their careers to learn not just the management of AI, but the leadership of AI. Mm. And I think the leadership of AI is few and far between in marketing now. So that training has to go all the way to the top. Um, I think the reskilling, upskilling um, to you know those words, I think no one quite knows how to do it because no one's had it done to them. So I think there's a huge business to be had in this training and book writing and um, you know how to how to improve your organ organization through through and with AI. Yeah, yeah. You know, although um, I don't know, we're probably getting off on a tangent, but when I think about that, if you're going to invest in a lot of really valuable training for the younger folks coming in uh, to the you know to the team, uh, then you don't want them to leave right away. Totally. And then the second big piece then is how do you create a, an environment for the working side, of, you know, the, where the, those, these marketers work so that they're going to stay after you've trained them? Because you've just invested, you know, a ton of money in getting that knowledge, you know, uh, inculcated into their brains. And now you want to reap that and uh, you have to make sure that they're, you know, incredibly motivated. They want to stay, they want to grow and they want to do some, some really, you know, good stuff for, for the company. And that, you know, I think that's going to be a second challenge for, for the marketing, for the marketing leadership. I totally agree. And it's not just um, like, you know, investment banking just throws you a lot of money to stay after they train you. I don't know if marketing has those dollars. Um, I think it is, I think if you can be, if you can see a um, career progression and that goes more quickly after having learned AI, and then if you go to a company that doesn't have the same level of technology and you have to take a career step back, I mm -hmm. think that will be a way to keep people without having to overpay them. It's going to be a different shift in culture for sure. Um, you know, how do we, how do we humans and we machines build a culture that is sticky and where people want to be? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. Uh, um, so I've been hiring uh, on my team, mostly uh, younger, 
younger folks coming right out of college. And one of the things that really interests them, I mean, money is, of, is of course, important and you have to be competitive. Sure. But the big thing that they say, man, I have learned so much working here. And uh, and I think that's because, you know, when you're, you know, 21, 22, you've spent all of your life learning, you know, from kindergarten, even preschool, kindergarten, yep. et cetera, up through college and maybe graduate school. And so you want to continue to learn because that's what your your life is. And so, uh, you know, if you can provide uh, uh, that learning experience and and obviously there's other things, but I think that learning experience where they can continue to uh, to learn is, is a, is a real good motivator for, for the younger folks. It totally. Is. And I think the, we were a virtual company for the most part and getting, finding ways for our younger teammates to learn, even frankly, everyone to learn in a virtual way has been something we really needed to pay attention to because it used to happen in offices, kind of the, you know, the, the hallway conversations is where you learn. Now we have to manufacture those a bit more, but I agree. It's all money is of course important. Um, but those learning opportunities are huge. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, let me uh, kind of get back. So then um, what other kind of uh, generative AI tools uh, do you think uh, is available where, you know, the brand marketers are doing more than just uh, chat GPT and some of the the kind of the the the, the easier or the, the the most immediate things? Yeah, the things, the places where we, I mean, I'm biased and I think our tool is great, um, but we, the places that we see, the most usage and use cases outside of kind of the base level one, you know, the writing, if you want to write something, chat GPT, if you want a quick image, you go to mid journey or similar um, things like perplexity or Waldo. I don't know if you know Waldo, but things that cite other sources. So if you can ask a pretty heady, robust question, get an answer full of different sources from around the internet. And there are some ethical questions there, which um, mm -hmm. I'm happy to talk about. But it is a great way of sourcing information um, from multiple, multiple. Sorry, um, getting source um, information from multiple sources and having the validation that it's correct. Mm. So what I haven't seen ChatGPT do yet in a good way is tie together all different sources and give you a more robust answer. So these platforms that are tying things together, seeing connections, has been where we see brands who are leading take big steps. Yeah, thank you for the lead on Walto. I'll definitely take a look at that because, uh, you know, that is uh, one of the challenges, you know, when you think about ChatGPT or any of the other ones, they're kind of just taking an average of what they see and they're putting that into, you know, a nice grammar engine. And really, it's just amazing how, how good it totally. comes out. And um, but they can't provide you the the source because they've averaged everything in. And exactly. uh, but being able to get the source of, hey, this this element of uh you know fact came from this source is uh is you know very critical to know yeah and even like um okay i have brand x who are my competitors and what should i worry about just even getting that source and it is sourcing from jp morgan's database google new york times like it is again ethical issues but it is sourcing from well and you can go to those they link to those sources so you can validate so mm. that just cuts time in a strategic discussion by almost you know almost infinity yeah 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 right so what so tell us about what you think the ethical concerns are because there's certainly many uh so what yeah, are like I, the top ones there i think the top ones are is is sourcing and from is scraping the internet to be able to source information for someone using your product is that stealing going going behind a paywall call it the new york times scraping information and presenting it as a piece of information that you genuinely sourced is that is it theft and um, I think that where publishers are going now, at least in my understanding, it's not my industry, is they are now quickly opening up their paywalls or opening up their data to be trained and be scraped um, as long as they get a monetary cut of it. So I think mm -hmm. publishers are realizing they sit on a massive source of data, um, be that the New York Times or platforms like Reddit, and how quickly how can they monetize before someone scrapes it for them? <laughs> well, good point. Um, you know, the like the New York Times, you know, I don't know how far how far back their archives go, but um, you know, that data or those articles it, it are incredibly valuable in when oh, you massive. look at them in total. Massive value. 
And um, I I didn't realize that uh, that they are allowing uh, Chat GPT and the other AI bots to go past the fi- the uh, the paywalls. Um, I thought that in many cases they were blocked, but uh, it, you, you're probably right that they are getting past the paywalls because that my is really where all of the all the data is. Yeah, and I'm I, I maybe my understanding is that I don't know if um, leaving the New York Times aside, publishers publishers in general, I don't know if they're allowing them past the paywall, mm. but um, uh, some of these platforms are allegedly finding ways through the paywall. <laughs> and so, um, well, that, that might be unethical then <laughs> that is stealing. That is stealing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well that, yeah, that's definitely taking something that, uh, somebody else created that value and, and you're now getting value out of it. So, totally. uh, yeah. Any other thoughts about ethical concerns with, uh, with AI or, or, oh, I think AI? if, um, at any time, I, I really enjoy reading sci-fi books, but anytime a, a machine is impersonating a human, there is potential for malfeasance or trickery. I think that AGI, and I think that all is a bit overstated at the moment, um, but I think anytime that someone feels they're being duped or someone feels they're chatting with a robot when it's claiming to be a human, there's a lot of ethical considerations there. And brands can get into trouble really quickly because if they want to talk to as many people as possible with a brand voice pretending mm-hmm. to be a human that that is a slippery slope because the cost efficiency is there but the ethic ethical the um yeah. ethics effectiveness i'm not so sure yeah yeah well and you know uh now here we're in the in the political season and i've oh, been yeah. surprised that uh it hasn't really uh that there hasn't been like maybe third parties or whatever that might be doing you know some weird things like that but I could see if you were in a a less free, more dic, you know, dic, uh, dictatorial uh, uh, country that they could easily, you know, generate something, you know, against their comp- their competitors or for them, and uh, and and it's hard. It would be hard to tell. I mean, I've I can't believe how how good some of these. You know some of these uh, these these uh, I don't know what you call them, but these these fake individuals oh, yeah. are in, in in replicating what what might be truth. Totally, and especially if it's just voice, and it's like this is an overheard recording, or you know, and mm. those have made or break made or um, broke elections for sure. So I think it's I know there are groups out there that are trying to stamp down disinformation, but with AI, disinformation just becomes more 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 yeah. everything. And so I agree with you. I wonder what will happen in the next 100 days. Yeah, 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 exactly. So do you think that's going to lead to uh, certain guidelines for marketers or certain regulations for marketers? Or do you think it's going to self-regulate? Or what do you you think is going to happen there? Um, I mean, looking at Silicon Valley's um, debate about who should win the presidential election, I think there, there will be regulation. There has to be. I think marketers have been pretty good through um, organizations like the ANA and others to find common regulations that we all agree to adhere to. Um, you know, it's not, it's, there, it's not law. There's no, it's, it's mm-hmm. a thing that we all voluntarily do. I think that the government will soon regulate what we can and can't do. I think it's getting out of hand and in, um, in public perception. I don't know if it's getting out of hand in technology, but it, the public is perceiving that this might be going sideways. And that's usually when the government jumps in to calm everyone down. Yeah, yeah. Although, you know, it's fascinating. And, uh, and you know, you think about free speech on the one side. And, you know, technically, that would be then regulating free speech. So totally. uh, that might be that is definitely going to be a challenge. And, and by the way, uh, when the government finally gets a regulation in place, the industry is already 10 years ahead of that. <laughs> Exactly. Oh, totally. And I don't know the equivalent of yelling fire in a crowded movie theater, you know, that famous, famous example. I don't know what that is for AI, but I feel like they're, even if the regulation is, um, you have to, you know, anything you put out gets run through a filter to prove it's not, mm-hmm. but then right. Technology just gets way ahead of ourselves. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. So, uh, as you've been, uh, moving more towards providing AI solutions for, for your clients, what kind of pushback have you had? Um, we've had the push. So Raya allows us to take a process that we've done for seven years that usually takes six weeks and we can do it in a day. And that is because we we use um, our data and the creativity and with humans in a room, and we can do a day-long session. 
the biggest pushback is not because we're not in the medical industry, because we're not in the legal industry. This is a creative function. We're allowed to think freely. Um, they wonder if it's as good and if it should, if they should pay us as much as they do by cutting time, yeah. it feels like, um, and we've cut the price a bit, um, but by cutting time, they wonder if the value is there. So it's proving that the divergent thinking, the volume of products that ideas that we put out is still worth the price that they are paying, which has been a really interesting shift because they've never had trouble when this much, it costs X for six weeks. Now it costs X minus Y for one day all of a sudden they start to wonder. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, uh, you know, I, I like the example because uh, as consultants and an agency and marketing and, you know, the same thing as an agency, creative agency, I always use the uh, the example that, um, yeah, you know, there's a ship, the the engine isn't working, they can't get the propeller to turn and they, they bring in this high powered guy and he comes in, he has a hammer, he looks around for about, you know, five minutes he takes the hammer and he goes bang like that. And then he walks away, the propeller turns and everything's in, in is everything is running. And, exactly. uh, and then he sends in a bill. It's for a hundred thousand dollars. And the guy says, what you, you know, that was five minutes worth of work. He says, yeah, but it was, took me 20 years to give you that five minutes worth of work. I love and, that. And that's, that's exactly so I'm what's gonna going to borrow on. that. That's really yeah, great. It, it is. It really is. Cause it is absolutely true. It took me, it took you whatever it is, seven years or 20 years to really understand exactly where to hit that uh, that engine so that totally. the propeller would start to turn. Oh, yeah. And I, I mean, like you, I've been in the marketing world for decades and I don't think we could, I couldn't be where I am now without all of that. Yeah. yeah. Now old school thinking, which is not that old school. So I'm I'm totally with you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll, I'll, I will let you borrow that story. <laughs> Thank you. I'll give you credit. I'll give you credit. Well, actually, it's not mine. I uh, <laughs> I, I read it from somewhere else. So uh, in one of those yeah. consulting journals or something like that. Totally. So um, uh, so what do you think the uh, the AI killer app is going to be uh, that that marketers should really start to uh, you know to look at? What do you think? What do you what do you think they're going to need to do? I think they're going to need to find a way um, to make make things in the world for people to consume or engage with or attend, make those more often and make those um, more, more precisely aligned to what people want in the world. Um, I think it's, I think the idea of micro targeting down, like I can make a better ad for you. I can make a better um, so, uh, Instagram post. I can make a better tweet is and personalize that to a to nth degree, I think is, soon going to be a waste of time. I think marketers need mm -hmm. to kind of pick their heads up, think what can we do for a large group of people? What can we, how can we engage them as a brand, be good to them um, and have them live outside of the digital life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important to how can AI help the masses enjoy something instead of just having a slightly better micro targeted ad. Wow. Cause that's, um, you know, one of the big things for AI is, um, is this mass personalization and you're kind of going to uh, you know the other way, and uh, saying. Well, I think there's... that mass personalization is massively important and will be, but I think it's a bit of a lowest common denominator. Mm. So, if what is um, we like to call them, you know, water cooler moments. What are things that brands can do that get people actually talking, not not tweeting, not to, but like actually talking in the real world, or mm -hmm. talking in a virtual world? Like, what is something that it's like? Oh my gosh, did you see that? We used to do that all the time, but I think AI mm -hmm. can now understand what people want in the world, at least ours can, understand what people want in the world, and then give you ideas to have that happen. Mm. Well, I like your point, uh, you know, it, it, that water cooler movement, uh, which is, oh my gosh, did you see that? And, uh, you know, and right now the meme is, oh my gosh, did you see the, uh, you know, the running of the 100 meter, uh, the 100 meter dash or whatever it is. Oh, yeah, certainly. And, yeah, yeah, that that is uh, very interesting because you're right. Then that that is kind of something that uh, you know does appeal to a larger audience and uh, and does get you to kind of stand out um, uh, in general as opposed to you know. I, I mean, I think you probably need to do both. You need to certainly, certainly. have the mass personalization, but to get that kind of uh, thing that's going to just bubble up higher than everybody else. That uh, uh, that's good. I really like that. 
Well, to Matt, I mean, it's it's marketing cliche, but let's say you get you put on a show or you create a piece of content and you the right piece of content that everyone starts talking about. Those are the hand raisers. Those are the people then you should micro target. So yeah. if you build a instead of just trying to find those people through social channels or search channels or, you know, what if we can actually get you to pay attention and then micro target? you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, good point. Good point. Yeah, good point. Um, you know, and that's uh, something too. I don't know if you've run into this, and this may sorry, it might be going off in a tangent. Is uh, you know, you you do you know, you segment and you micro segment and you target all these folks, and uh, you can do very well by doing that. But then there's all these people that you're ignoring over here. Exactly. And uh, and what you're kind of saying is, well, how can I you know, kind of also generate something from them that I I didn't even know about. I didn't even know that they were going to be interested in my product. And I get them talking about something and then all of a sudden, hey, I've, you know, I missed them. You know, here's a new opportunity for me. Exactly. So and we so Raya, for example, I'll give you an example um, of one piece of trivia. So we were a uh, former client was a um, wealth management service. So their average their client's average net worth was 20 million dollars or more. So put those people in your mind. Raya told us their favorite musical genre. Do you want to guess what it is? Um, uh, uh, acid rock. <laughs> oh, that's close. It's EDM, electronic dance music. And all of a sudden, they're like, "Wow, our our audience is much younger, much you know, much more tech rich than we thought." Um, the the musical genre that they're most passionate about is trap or southern hip hop. And so, <laughs> every time we talk to a brand, they learn something new about their audience. Who would have thought something like Outkast? would resonate, your neck of the woods in Atlanta, would resonate with people who had $20 million or more. Now, it's not like they go and went and sponsored Outcast, and they could, but how do you use that to understand your audience better, make content, make experiences for them? So it's like, how do we actually take what we know about people and make something new that, you know, when others are zigging, we zag? Yeah, yeah. No, that is, uh, that's awesome. And, it, you know, it is those little nuggets that you find out that really can, you know, you know make your brand stand out. No question totally. about it. Yeah. Totally. Well, as much as I'd like to uh, go on for another hour uh, with you, I, 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 I have to ask one last question. Great. Love it. And, um, and that is, uh, so what kind of advice would you give a new up and coming marketer? Wow. Um, I think, one of my favorite things that a new and up and coming marketer has the ability to ask, and I give this counsel a lot, is there is, and I think it still works for you and I, but people coming into the industry, find people that are doing cool stuff, send them a note that says, I think you're doing cool stuff. Can I talk to you for 15 minutes? Because almost everyone has an ego enough that if someone says what you're doing is neat, can I learn about it? They will most often give you time. And I think there is a, there is being new in the industry, being novice, being, you know, naive, whatever you want to call it, having that sense of wonder, but then asking about that wonder is a great, is a great tool that you have in your youth that I didn't take advantage enough of <laughs> when I was young. But beyond that, beyond that kind of networking skill, um, I think that someone, and specifically in terms of AI, a lot of people coming into the industry will have an innate understanding of it just like 10 years ago people were coming into marketing could understood in their bones how social media worked and they were able to connect what's happening on snapchat with instagram with Facebook. they could see it in their minds i think there are so many ai tools but no ai strategy and i think people entering the industry are better ai strategists than people who've been at it for decades because they can see it they've lived mm -hmm. it they understand how the connections work they might not have the words or the brand fit yet but being being an advocate for yourself and really saying, I know how this all works together, let me tell you about it, I think can be something that can really add value and really grow their careers quickly. Wow. Yeah, that is uh, that is interesting. And uh, I think you're right. I mean, you know, as you get older, you kind of uh, miss out on what's going on in, in these new technologies. And uh, and you need somebody that uh, that can maybe uh, you know, kind of pull things together, but maybe not in the context of your brand, but being able to combine that younger folk, that younger person with the mature, you know, experienced person can really also then help on the, on, on that. I think so. And I think um, if someone reaches out to you and says, I think what you do is cool. And you say, I don't want to talk to you. That says something about the the person being reached out to <laughs> more than anyone else. So I think 
just being, you know, I think there's a lot of empathy and a lot of kindness in the world that uh, can go around. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Mark, thank you so much. I'm so glad you were able to uh, participate today and uh, really appreciate your insights. I learned something and I took a couple of notes and hopefully Great. the other things and thoughts that we had, uh, I'll remember them as well. And uh, But in any case, uh, where can folks uh, reach out to you and learn more about you and your company and uh, and, and Raya? Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It was great to chat with you. I learned a bunch too. Um, the website is askraya.com and um, just sign up for more and you can ask for demo access or read our blog with more insights and ideas. No, oh, fantastic. So askraya.com. So askraya.com. That's correct. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Well, Mark, thank you so much. And for the audience, please stay tuned for many other videos in this series of the backstory on marketing and AI. And if you can, please visit marketingmachine.prorelevant.com. And there's a handful of uh, excerpts that you can download and hopefully, hopefully learn more. And uh, if you like this episode, please rate it with five stars. Mark, thank you so much. Thanks, Guy. Have a great day. Thank you. You too.